Hello, everybody, and good morning. I want to welcome you to our next Precisionary Scientific Series webinar talk. And this time we are hosting Dr. Pallavi Sakar. Um, so Dr. Sakar is an accomplished instructor in the Department of Pharmacology, Physiology, oh, pardon, um, and neuroscience at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. She works in conjunction with uh, Professor Vanessa Ruth. Um, and their research focuses on exploring the intricate role of the hypothalamus in maintaining energy balance, utilizing a variety of techniques from electrophysiology to behavioral analysis. And today, Dr. Sakar will be presenting on lateral hypothalamus or rex and neurons in energy homeostasis. We are really excited to dive into her insights on how these neurons play a pivotal role in metabolic conditions and the implications for understanding energy homeostasis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Pallavi Sakar. And with that, I wanna hand the microphone over to you and thank you again. Thank you, Abby. Welcome everybody. Welcome to my talk where we talk about lateral hypothalamus or and neurons. And today we are hopefully going to understand how electrophysiological techniques are used to uncover the function of the glucose sensing cells in the hypothalamus, their roles in energy homeostasis, explore the glucose sensing mechanism and how it is affected in insulin-induced hypoglycemia, and therefore how it changes behavioral response of an animal. We'll also examine how calorie restriction changes glucose sensing at a cellular and molecular level. First, we will look into the energy, uh, the electrophysiology of the cells and what they are and what is energy homeostasis. So we can view energy homeostasis as a stable physiological state where the energy input via food intake equals to energy output via physical activity, um, thermogenesis, me basic metabolism, etc. And whatever is left over turns into energy storage that's stored in the body. And it's affected by a number of factors like nutrient availability, developmental stage and age, environmental and genetic factors. So when energy input is equal to energy output and storage, that results in a very stable body weight. But when there is an imbalance, in the energy homeostasis, particularly with a positive energy balance, which means, like, for example, as we age, our metabolic rate goes down. So energy expenditure is actually going down. But if the food intake remains the same, then we have an increase in energy storage, which will lead to a weight gain, gain of weight. Now, this is Sim like uh, similar for other scenarios as well, wherever we see a positive energy balance. So we um, think about this and think about how uh, weight gain leads to obesity. Obesity affects more than one, um, one in three adults and 17% of children and adolescents in this country. Being overweight or obese increases the risk of type two diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and other diseases, among which diabetes per se also further um, aggravates this energy imbalance. Obesity costs the US healthcare system almost $173 billion a year, and this cost is progressively going up. So now we start to think about how to tackle this, how to control this obesity pandemic. And what we first want to think about is that obesity is a global problem, not only geographically, but also when you think about the body. As an organismic level, obesity is a global problem that affects every single tissue or organ of the body. And the main center that affects obesity is um, controls, controls the energy homeostasis is brain. So in the brain, there are a group of nuclei known as the hypothalamus that control various aspects of this energy homeostasis. These areas sense levels of nutrient, 
and then they send out different signals. They also sense hormones and other um, humoral factors in the body. And the, the signals they send out are in to the liver, to the pancreas, um, to skeletal muscles, white adipose tissues to increase glucose and lipid metabolism, as well as to brown, fat, brown adipose tissue to increase thermogenesis. Now we have to think about evolutionarily, we have been uh, a species that developed with a food paucity in mind. When you think about the cavemen, we were running around finding wildebeest and feasting on them and then storing that energy for a couple days or weeks till we get the next big meal. So the these areas of the brain are extremely well uh, fine-tuned to sense a paucity of nutrients and they can change the metabolism accordingly so that there is there is not a significant drop in the body's uh, energy homeostasis. So basically when there is less food, these areas can signal, um, the, these brain areas can signal the tissue to bring down the metabolism rate and that thereby conserving energy. But as a food became more and more available, and instead of feasting on wild, wild beast once once in a while, now we have food around the block. Every time we walk around the corner, there you would find a grocery store or bodega. It's it's so easy to actually access food right now. Coupled with that, physical activity has gone down as well, and these areas are not so well in control of that. We did not; these areas did not evolve to control. Uh, to st um, stabilize the home energy homeostasis in face of a nutrient overabundance. That's why we see so much of an um, over um, larger um, prevalence of obesity nowadays. Out of these two areas, um, sorry, out of these brain areas, our lab is focused on the lateral hypothalamus and the ventromedial hypothalamus. And we look into how these two specific areas um, are contributing to energy homeostasis. But for today's talk, I will confine our discussions to just the lateral hypothalamus. But the next question is, how do, why is the lateral hypothalamus so in, interesting and important? And to know that, we'll look at to these cells. These are known as orexin or hypoprotein cells that are present in the lateral hypothalamus, the perifornical hypothalamus, and the dorsomedial hypothalamus. These are the only areas in the brain that these cells are present. And these cells have this unique ability to sense glucose. And why this is crucially important for our survival is that brain only uses glucose for its, like, um, nutrition. So sensing glucose or um, getting to know where the glucose level is so as to change the bodily metabolic rate and other things is important. That's why glucose sensing is such an integral part of the survival of the organism as well as well-functioning of the brain. Now, these cells not only sense glucose, they also have a very big impact on different bodily functions. What we know so far are that the orexin cells are involved in sleep arousal system. They're also involved in reward and motivation, food motivation. They're also uh, uh, involved in addiction, neuroendocrine, and autonomic function. So um, for our um, lab's research, we focus on the lateral hypothalamus and um, food seeking behavior or motivation and the uh, perifornical hypothalamus and its effect in sleep and arousal system. And these are the two um, projects that you'll be seeing today in the objectives two and three. But the first question of the day is, how do we actually look into these neurons? How do we know that they're sensing glucose and how they are changing their behavior? So the standard procedure 
that we apply in the lab is a wholesale electrophysiology of brain slices. We have a transgenic line that um, uh, um, of mice, orexin mice, that expresses GFP in the orexin cell, thereby making it easier for us to locate the cells and patch these cells. So we would start by taking, um, isolating the brain of these animals, getting coronal sections, and then into the LH or peripheral areas where we would see green fluorescent cells, we will patch these cells with a um, glass pipette, which has a recording electrode inside it. And that recording e electrode sends out signal to the signal acquisition system. And that, there we see uh, the electrical behavior of the cell. And so in this whole cell setup, what we see are, um, there are two different things that we can do in this whole cell setup. The whole cell setup basically is when you have the pipette uh, attached to the cell membrane and we have sucked a small portion of the membrane out so as to now, whatever solution is inside the pipette is equilibrated with the cytosol of the cell. So whatever changes are going on inside the cell, we can sense it via the recording electrode inside the pipette. Now we can do two things here to this cell. We can either um, hold the cells in a voltage clamp mode. That is, we can hold the membrane potential of the cell at a given voltage, or we can send current pulses into the cell. Now, when it is in a voltage clamp mode, that is, we have held the membrane potential at a certain voltage, we would see whole cell currents which would be due to ion channel activity. Or we would see postsynaptic currents that are a result of a presynaptic pre input, that is an input coming from the, um, this, uh, the nearby neuron that's sending a signal. When we are in the current clamp mode, we can either give a depolarizing um, current pulse or a hyperpolarizing current pulse. A depolarizing current pulse will um, depolarizing, uh, depolarize the neuron and you will see action potentials. A hyperpolarizing current pulse, on the other hand, will show you a membrane potential change, which would look as a negative change here, like you see that U-shaped um, structure here. And this also, um, th this is a membrane, so this is a voltage change. And since we know from Ohm's law that voltage change is directly proportional to the change of resistance, we actually look into this, this um, the effect of the hyperpolarizing current, and we quantify this as a change in resistance. In other words, in very simple words, you can think about that a change in resistance denotes excitability or activity of the cell. So the higher the resistance change is, the cell is more active or more excited. So next, we look into what, how do they look? The orexin neur neurons, how do they actually look? Or other glucosensing cells, how do, how do we know that they have changed in presence of glucose? In, in other words, they can sense the glucose. So here are some hyper representative tra uh, traces from, um, and. I'm sorry, my laser pointer seems to be stuck. Um, we see um, voltage responses to hyperpolarizing pulses. In gray, you would see when the cell is held in 2.5 millimolar glucose. Now, 2.5 millimolar is um, what would, 2.5 millimolar glucose in the brain would be um, the fed state. It would mimic the fed state at, at which what, at the fed state, at euglycemic state, what the glucose level of the brain should be. And then we look at, we changed the bath where the brain slice is sitting to 0.1 millimolar glucose here in black, you would see. And what you will see is that, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention 0.1 millimolar glucose also is what should be when the brain goes into hypoglycemic state. So very low glucose in the body would uh, 
second word like would look like a what 0.1 millimolar glucose in the bath solution would look like. And what we see here is that that with 2.5 millimolar glucose and a hyperpolarizing current, you see a dip here. But that looks bigger when you have a lower glucose. Now, cells can actually, the glucose sensing cells in the brain globally, can behave in two different ways. They can, so the first category can are, are called glucose excited cells. What happens in these cells are when you keep them in 2.5 millimolar glucose, you can see the action potentials here. And you, this is where the 50, negative 50 millivolt is the baseline membrane potential of the cell. So this, these are the cells that are sitting, the glucose excited cells that are sitting in a high glucose solution, 2.5 millimolar. And then we change the solution to 0.1 millimolar. What happens is you see that there is a cessation of action potential. The cell is getting deactivated. So these are glucose excited cells or glucose excitable cells because they become more active in presence of a higher glucose. The second type of glucose sensing cells are known as glucose inhibited cells. So you see the cell in first in 2.5 millimolar glucose and you see that as opposed to the glucose excited cells, they have very minimal activity. But then we start changing the glucose to 0.1 uh, millimolar glucose concentration, that is the lower glucose concentration. And we start seeing the membrane potential go up. So it's depolarizing. And then we start seeing action potential. So this cell is actually getting activated in, in the absence of glucose, or rather in the presence of a low glucose concentration. But then as soon as we start increasing the glucose concentration to 2.5 millimolar, we start seeing it coming down to baseline. So these are known as glucose inhibited neurons because they change their uh, activity in, uh, they're, they're inhibited in higher glucose. So the glucose excited and inhibited neurons are basically what we are referring to, how they behave in presence of high glucose. So for the orexin neurons, we have found them to be mainly glucose inhibited. Now there are two different types of glucose inhibited neurons, a sustained or SGI, which is, uh, this is the same, same um, uh, uh, representative trace from the previous slide. And you will see that as we have increased the point one, it increases its action potential and stays that way. It stays activated till the glucose is at lower concentration. And then it uh, goes back to its baseline when we have changed it to um, high glucose. On the other hand, the adapting or AGIs are, they um, what they do is when um, there is, the cell sits in low glucose, it starts very similar to the SGIs, but as time goes on, their activity ceases. And while it's still in that low glucose zone, it has come back to baseline. So these are basically adapting and we think, we still don't know exactly what their um, function is per se and why or why these two type of glucose sensing cells exist. But these are the cells that are almost like changing, sensing the change in glucose and then they quickly go back to baseline. But these cells are the ones which will actually sustain the active, um, excitability in presence of low glucose. And in our studies, we have actually seen a good mixture of both SGIs and AGIs in the orexin cells. Now, the question we started asking ourselves was, what are the molecular mechanism? How, how do these sense glucose? What are the downstream mechanism? But also, are there any molecular difference between the SGIs and AGIs? So this is how anorexin neuron in the uh, perifornical hypothalamus would look like. And the top is the SGI, that sustained GI, which has very sustained action potential. And the bottom one has is the 
at GI. Adapting GI with changes, senses the change, and then quickly goes back to its baseline. What we did the first part of experiment was we wanted to know whether this change, this can, these neurons can change, sense a change of glucose concentration by sensing the change in ATP formation. Glucose, when go, uh, it goes inside the cell, it gets metabolized and it produces ATP. So our first question was that, does it actually sense glucose by metabolizing the glucose? And so what we did was we changed our uh, pipette solution uh, for, uh, like we had two different pipette solution, a two millimolar and a five millimolar uh, pipette solution of ATP concentration. And you're looking at change of resistance in the SGI and change of resistance in the ADGI neurons. And this is percentage change in the resistance from when we change the um, um, path solution from 2.5 to 0.1 millimolar glucose. What you will see is that they both have an increase in uh, resistance, SGI and ADGI, but none of them show any significant difference between 2, 2 millimolar ATP or 5 millimolar ATP. That tells us something. That tells us that the cells don't really need to metabolize glucose to sense glucose. They actually Sense, glucose, sense the glucose molecule per se. And we further verified that by using a functional analog of glucose, which is known as the 2-deoxyglucose or 2-DG. It actually has just one single hydroxyl group that is different from the original glucose molecule. And what it results in is that when it's inside the cell, glucose gets converted to glucose 6-phosphatase and thereby goes through the rest of the cycle and generates ATP. But 2-DG cannot go inside the cell and get converted into the glucose 6-phosphatase. So it cannot be metabolized. So it's a non-metabolizable analog. And when we... um. And we are looking at our old friends of um, SGI and ADGI again. And we have changed their um, glucose concentration from 2.5 to 0.1. We are seeing a huge increase in resistance. And then we add 2.5 .5 millimolar of 2-deoxyglucose into the bath. And what we see is that they abruptly come down to the baseline. That tells us that the 2 the the 2-DG or the 2-deoxyglucose is acting at similar in a sim very similar fashion as the glucose molecule itself. And the cells are perceiving the 2-deoxyglucose as the higher glucose solution. And you can see the same um, in here in the changes in resistance in SGI and ADGI. Again, we don't see a difference in their responses because SGI and ADGI both behave the exactly same way to 2-deoxyglucose. So going back, like reiterating the same thing, that glucose molecule per se is sensed, not the glu uh, metabolized, like metabolizable, uh, after metabolism. The next thing we wanted to know was that, is this something that other cells are sending a signal to retin cells to sense the glucose? And to do that, we actually blocked um, the signals coming from presynaptic um areas with the help of sodium channel broker tetrodotoxin. Tetrodotoxin will block um, the presynaptic input to the cell, which will lead to a uh, cessation of action potential. So we won't see any action potential here. But what we see is that, again, it, both SGIs and ADGIs, you see an increase in membrane potential, also a change in resistance. So this tells us that this glucose sensing is an intrinsic property of the cell. It doesn't change with cutting out all the outside signal. Also, it doesn't change when the glucose molecule is metabolized in different ways. So glucose molecule per se that is getting sensed and it's, um, it's independent of any um, peripheral input. And we see um, the other point of interest that we see here is that if you look at the changes in the resistance in these cells at the control um, versus in presence of tetrodotoxin, you will see a greater increase in the resistance change. And this also tells us that 
perhaps rather points us to the fact that there must be a tonic inhibition that is coming to these cells from presynaptic inputs and adding the tetrodotoxin removes this input. And now the cells are even more um, uh, excitable in presence of low glucose. So the next question we wanted to ask is what kind of receptor is sensing glucose? We still don't know the exact identity of this glucose receptor. But we first started by looking at um, G protein coupled receptors. And we looked at the uh, GI, GO subunit inhibitor, pertussis toxin. And we incubated the cells for two hours and then went ahead and looked into glucose sensing. And you're looking at changes in membrane potential and changes in resistance. And what we see is that in presence of cortisis toxin, there is a very little change when we change the bath glucose from 2.5 to 0.1. Which, so now we are going nearing Closer, we are going closer to identifying the identity of the glucose receptor. And then we started asking what other intercellular me like molecules are, are involved in this mechanism. And we know that oftentimes a G protein coupled receptor sends signal through adenylate cyclase and that activates protein kinase A inside the cell. So our next step was to figure out whether protein kinase A inhibition would affect this um, glucose sensing. So next we utilized RPCMP, which is a protein kinase A inhibitor. We incubated the cells with RPCMP, and then we looked into, again, changes in membrane potential and changes in resistance in phase of changing glucose from 2.5 to 0.1. And in we can see that in low glucose, we stop seeing that response that we see in control situations versus the PKA inhibitor. So now we are nearing, like closer, we are getting closer to understanding what exactly the pathway could be through which the uh, the orexin cells sense glucose. So now the next obvious question is, yes, they sense glucose, but then what? How does it affect other like other bodily functions? How does it affect behavior? So with that, we come to our second learning objective. That is to explore how its um, glucose sensing mechanism if, is affected in repeated insulin-induced hypoglycemia and behavioral responses thereafter. So to go there, we'll just make a brief detour into what is insulin-induced hypoglycemia. So in this mammalian body, the glucose ranges between, blood glucose ranges between 80 to 120 milligrams per DL. This is the hypo, this is the euglycemic range. And um, anything beyond 120 is known as hyperglycemic and below 80 is hypoglycemic range. And, um, the body strives to maintain the blood glucose with the help of insulin and other hormones between this range, the 80 to 120 range. But in diabetes, we often see that the blood glucose is getting higher and higher towards in the hyperglycemic range. And in type 1 diabetes, one of the first um, line of treatment would be insulin injection. And the insulin injection, what it does, it, it brings down the blood glucose from hyper to euglycemic state. But often what we see in clinical scenarios is that adding insulin to a system not only, not only brings it down to the euglycemic range, sometimes it actually pushes the blood glucose towards the hypoglycemic range. And the body actually has a very good mechanism. As I told you before, that we were uh, programmed to be excellent um, you know, burning machine. We were very, very good at conserving energy. So the body mounts a range of um, act, uh, uh, hormonal changes that leads to, you, leads to increase in food intake. Because if we eat, the blood glucose is going to go back up. 
So this, we are talking about type one diabetes when we have given a subject insulin and instead of bringing the blood glucose back to euglycemic range, it is taking down to hypoglycemic range, which leads to, um, but so what, what drives that food intake? What happens is this, there is a whole battery of hormonal counter regulatory responses. As soon as the body senses the glucose is going below 70, it will change, do all of this, um, actions through these hormones that will elevate the blood glucose. When it goes down even further, the next part of it we see is a neurogenic response. That is when we start seeing, um, feeling dizzy, palpitations, anxiety, sweating, and all of these actually makes the person seek food, eat food. But when that doesn't happen and the blood sugar falls even lower, there is <clears throat> often very fatal consequences. But what happens in diabetes is that with repeated insulin injections, we see multiple episodes, repeated episodes of blood glucose going to hypoglycemic levels. And after a certain point, these effective mechanisms, the hormonal part, the hypoglycemia awareness part, they stop working. So the person who has received insulin, a successive insulin shots over the course of some days and has experienced hypoglycemia. In the beginning, they actually sense hypoglycemia. They feel bad. They would seek out food. But after repeated hypoglycemic in uh, incidences, they lo start losing the feeling of hypoglycemia. So we started asking question that we know that the orexin neurons are involved in awareness, arousal. So do they get affected when there is a lot of hypoglycemic events uh, occurring in succession? So to do that, we took mice and we injected this mice with insulin for three successive days. We injected insulin and watched their blood glucose go down below 50 milligrams per deciliter of blood glucose. And then after two hours, it slowly came back up. So this happened for three days and the control animals were injected with saline. What we see is that with repeated um, insulin injection, we lose that effect of low blood glucose. So we are looking at the uh, brain slices again in the orexin cells in the peripheral area. And what we see is that saline injection, we see the effect of low blood glucose, that it's still getting more excited, more active with low blood glucose, but that effect is lost in present in after three days of hypoglycemia, recurrent hypoglycemia. And the effect is present in both the AGIs and the SGIs. And you can see it there that it's almost non-existent, uh, non-existent after a certain time. But then how does it relate to behavior? To know that, we um, developed our first model of mice condition place preference. And what we did is we took boxes that had two distinct compartments with a sliding door, which had patterned walls. And we let the mice roam around between the two boxes for the first three days. And then we tested them to see which side they liked them like more. And Trust me, I was as surprised to find that they actually have a preference over check side or the stripe side. So it was extremely funny for us that they have preferences for their wallpapers. So um, once we figured out which side they liked, we called them that their preferred side. And then for the next six to eight days, we blocked the sliding, we pushed down the sliding door and confined the mice to their preferred side with no incentives. But on the non-preferred side, with Fruit Loops, extremely sugary, extremely palatable, and then we did that for a couple about eight days. After that time period, we tested them again, and what we find is that this time they spent more time on that Fruit Loop side. Now they're not caring about their wallpapers anymore. They like the Fruit Loops. They want to stay with the Fruit Loop. <clears throat> 
And then we had this mice in their home cages and we repeated the recurrent hypoglycemia procedure where they where we gave them three um, successive days of insulin, brought their uh, blood glucose down and the control mice got saline. And then we brought them back again to these cages, uh, CPP boxes. And this time, we didn't have fruit loops on their uh, non-preferred side. What we did was we gave them one shot of insulin that is enough to induce hypoglycemia. And then we let them sit here to experience hypoglycemia in this corner. And then we tested again to see where they spend most time. And the final testing day, they don't have fruit loops or hypo hypoglycemia incidences. They're just like, they are free to roam around in either um compartment of the box. And what we find is that with the uh, control animals, the time spent on the non-preferred side, that they spent less time with conditioning, condition place preference, they basically where they got the fruit loops, they are starting to spend more time on the fruit loop side. And then after the insulin or injection or the hypoglycemia incidence, their timing the time spent on this side goes down back to the baseline where they started. What this tells us is that hypoglycemia is unpleasant for even the animals. They actually remember this as a negative experience. As I said, when the blood glucose falls below a certain level, the hypoglycemia awareness component, the neurological aspect of, new aspect of it would make you feel dizzy, disoriented, anxious, and would drive you to eat food, right? But what happens with those animals that actually experience hypoglycemia before, that three days of hypoglycemia in their home cages? We find they actually have not experienced that bad incidence. And what they do is they spend less time on their non-preferred side, they find cheap fruit loops, love them, and then after that one incidence in the box, they are loving the fruit loops even more. So they are not even registering that bad incidence, that hypoglycemic incidence that they experienced in the box as in any negative. And this sort of it like translates into real life where we see people who had gone into coma because of low blood glucose, not knowing why the glucose was going down. So they were getting completely unaware um, of what is happening in their body. They, they actually stopped feeling that um, sensation that the blood glucose is going down. Now, we started asking that these neurons the orexin neurons are involved in awareness, arousal states, and hypoglycemia unawareness, that they don't know that hypoglycemia has happened, is also sounds like a, a fa failure of the arousal state. So we came upon this FDA-approved drug called modafinil. It's actually used as a standard treatment for narcolepsy, and we thought... Uh, because it improves the arousal state. And we started asking whether this will help. So we had um, modafinil in the um, injected modafinil to these animals before they got insulin on their preferred site. So before going into the box, before getting high, uh, the insulin injection, they get one modafinil. And what happens with this? hypoglycemia group. You saw in the previous uh, slide that they actually had a higher preference for food, fruit loops, but now they're back to normal. They actually registered that incidence as a bad incidence, a negative experience like the control animals. So that tells us that if we change the arousal state, if we make the, like, if we can somehow affect the arousal pathway that leads out of LH uh, or XN neurons, we can actually counter this um, deadly consequences of insulin injection. And it's all often a rate limiting state for um, type 1 diabetes treatment with insulin injections. So that is very exciting. And then we also wanted to look at what happens with this cells 
electrophysiologically. And what we find is that, that the RH animals, the animals that had repeated insulin injections, but also treated with modafinil, regain back their um, effect of low glucose. So this is extremely exciting. And we see that the perifornical hypothalamus is affected with recurrent hypoglycemia. Modafinil affects it in a positive way, and that uh, activates the arousal awareness pathway, which would lead the animal to go seek food, thereby maintaining its energy homeostasis. Now we are going to change gears completely and look into how caloric restriction changes glucose sensing. And for, to do that, what we did was we restricted cal um, food from animals and brought their body weight down to 85% of their initial weight and then maintained the body weight at that level for a week. After a week, we looked into their blood glucose and as expected, the blood glucose was lower in the calorie restricted animal compared to the control. The hunger hormone ghrelin was actually elevated in this animals. Again, not surprising at all. The satiety hormone leptin was also decreased. Again, very expected with calorie restriction, hungry animals, you have more hunger hormone, less satiety hormone. What happens in there in the orexin cells then? In the orexin cells, what we see is that regular response with the controlled animals that you see an increase with um, increase in excitability with lowered blood glucose. But on the calorie restricted animal, we see a much more pronounced um, activation in presence of lowered blood glucose. And then we wanted to ask, where is ghrelin working then? Because it's, it's in a way that we, we're looking at glucose sensing cells, but the hunger hormone, how is it affecting? And we see that in presence of ghrelin, the cells behave very similarly to lowered, how it would behave in presence of lowered blood glucose. And it's also blocked by RPCMP, which is a PKA inhibitor, as I have shown you before. So it's very exciting to note that the hunger signal, as well as the glucose sensing signal, they're actually overlapping onto the same neuron. They are also using, utilizing this exact same molecular pathway to bring about changes in food intake. But how does it happen? So what happens is orexin cells signal to VTA, the ventral tegmental area, dopamine neurons. Dopamine neur the VTA dopamine neurons are very well known for their drive. They, they are responsible for drive to seek food. So it's like a motivated, food motivated behavior that would lead to more food intake. And they also receive inputs from other glutamatergic presynaptic neurons. When these glutamatergic neurons are um, convert, um, the, uh, the glutamates are released from the presynaptic neuron, the presynaptic neuron here, and they're um, sensed by the two glutamatergic um, receptors, the NMDA receptor and the AMPA receptor. In the postsynaptic neurons, that is the VTA neurons, we see currents, two distinct currents. One is called the NMDA current and the AMPA current. And the ratio of AMPA and NMDA current is known as as the marker for synaptic plasticity. In other words, how strong the synapse is. The larger the current, the st more strong the synapse would be, the bigger response to um, an upstream signal to go and seek food. And we wanted to see if orexin is sending signals to the VTA neurons, a lowered blood glucose, as in calorie restriction, does it affect how, so we already know that it, it has affected the glucose sensing in the orexin. 
we want or it's in cells per se now we want to know when this sends the downstream signal to the vta can it affect the glutamate currents in the vta dopamine neurons or not and to do that we went back to our slicers we looked at uh, sagittal sectioning so this is actually looking at this plane because if you do coronal section the lh and the vta won't be in the same plane so we wanted to keep the connection between the LH and the VTA constant, like in present in the cells, in the slices. And then we patched um, neurons in the um, voltage clamp mode that I showed you in the beginning of the talk. And then looked into the currents, the VTA, uh, v um, the ampere current and the NMDA current in the VTA. After our um, slam, Electrophysiology was done. We did IHC and looked at uh, tyrosine hydroxylase and biocetin overlap to make sure that the cells we patched were, were actually dopamine cells. And I have to say our slicers give amazing slices to look at um, the electrophysiology as well as the IHC of the cells. And then when we look at the AMPA current, we see that with control uh, versus the calorie restricted animal, there is a much um, larger response of AMPA current. But NMDA current, we don't see a very big change. So when we look at the AMPA to NMDA ratio, we see that there is an increase in the ratio. And I, I told you before that a change in the ratio signifies a change in synaptic plasticity or the strength of the synapse. So these will be, these have a higher drive to um, drive food intake. So changes in orexin, calorie restriction leading to uh, lowered blood glucose, leading to changes in glucose sensitivity of the orexin cells that leads to changes in the ampere current of the VTA dopamine neurons. But then what happens with the um, behavior, food intake? We are back to our um, condition place preference box again. The animals are habituated and they're, they roam freely between the checked and striped side for five days. And then sixth day, they get to know which side, we get to know which side they prefer the most. And then we condition them on their non-preferred side. That is, they did not like the wallpaper there with fruit loops. And then at the end, we looked at the, the preference of the animals now, whether they prefer, which side they prefer more, the fruit loop side or the not fruit loop side, but the pretty nice wallpaper side. And what we find is that when we look at the second spent on the non-preferred slide, that is with Fruit Loop side, that with ad-lib animals, as expected, they prefer the Fruit Loop sides more. But the calorie restricted animal actually significantly like the Fruit Loop side more. And that kind of makes perfect sense because don't we all love junk food when we're extremely hungry? So that kind of behavior is what is what that behavior is driven by a very friendly orexin cells that sends the blood glucose and then sends the signal to like the food more the food becomes more palatable and with that i bring you to the summary of today's talk and we looked at orexin glucose sensing neurons and found that they are not, they sense glucose molecule per se. They are not dependent on ATP concentration. They are also not dependent on any presynaptic inputs for glucose sensing. And uh, we also saw that they have some uh, G-protein coupled receptor that sends signal to PK protein, protein kinase A pathway uh, to sense blood glucose. So we are, sorry, changes in glucose. And then, in the peri perifornical hypothalamus, we saw that with recurrent hypoglycemia, the glucose sensing of the cells gets abolished. So they are not um, sensing, uh, they're not changing their um, excitability with the glue, glue, blood glucose anymore. But then in a, with addition of modafinil, we can actually revert that back, which would help with arousal or awareness state of the animal. And which would help in 
increased food intake and energy homeostasis. On the other hand, we saw in the lateral hypothalamus how calorie restriction and ghrelin both help sensitize those cells more to a low blood glucose sorry, to, to a lowered glucose, sensitized to a low glucose, which would drive a food intake or food-seeking behavior through the um, VTA dopamine neurons. And that goes back to maintain it, maintaining a stable energy state or homeostasis. With that, I would like to thank um, the Ruth Lab, the present and past members, Dr. Ruth, um, funding sources and our department and I would happily take any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarkar. Um, if you have any questions in our audience, please feel free to unmute yourself or ask or ask in the chat. Um, I had one, um, Dr. Sakar, which is you mentioned that there were two different types of orexin glucose sensing neurons that you found and that you recorded from. Um, have you explored additional types of like short-term or long-term plasticity? I saw that you were in current clamp, but maybe in voltage clamp, there are specific types of plasticity associated in the, in the, for, with the neurons. And if so, are there any differences? We actually haven't looked at plasticity of the orexin neurons per se, because we know that orexin neurons send out signals to the um, uh, other areas that affect the motivation. So we were actually looking at VTA uh, plasticity. Got it. Got it. Um, and how about the glucose sensing? Um, you talked about um, uh, repeat hypoglycemia. Um, which is common in type 1 diabetes. Now, for type 2 diabetes, there's usually early onset and like more long-term type 2 diabetes. What are some of the compensatory mechanisms of type 2 diabetes uh, or those types of animal models on the glucose sensing ability? That's something that we are actually looking at this point. We are trying to figure out, we are uh, looking at different diabetic models and we are trying to see how the orexin cells behave differently. So that's that's something that we're currently doing. So that is really exciting. The, we yeah. are definitely looking for no, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is really exciting because mm -hmm. um it's we can see a direct application in translational um research mm -hmm. of your work. Also, when I you think about obesity, you don't like you know, that's type two diabetes. You're not talking about type one diabetes. That's right. So yeah. That's that's why we're looking into different models of diabetes in the lab and trying to figure out how do the orexin cells change. So in like obese animals versus a diabetic model. So right. Right. we're we're trying to do that. Wonderful. Um I don't see any other uh, comments um, or questions. So I wanna go ahead and thank you, Dr. Pallavi Sarkar, and please give our best to um, Dr. Renessa Ruth. And um, we're, it's wonderful to have you. And we hope that in um, a year or two, we'll have you back to give us some more an, of a depth update on your research. Definitely. And hopefully the VMH part now, because yes. that has amazing uh, st like studies that are going on too. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you for everybody who attended. Bye-bye.